Athletes have often used their voices and led the way in matters of racial justice. At this tipping point for our country, athletes are once again speaking out, using their platform to look back and look ahead, as they will this evening in Race and Sports in America, Conversations. Welcome to Lake Tahoe. I'm your host, Damon Hack. Tonight, we'll be sitting down with two round tables. Coming up in a little while, I'll visit with Steph Curry, Charles Barkley, Ozzie Smith, and Jimmy Rollins. Right now, I'm pleased to welcome in the head coach of the Los Angeles Chargers, Anthony Lynn. Minnesota Vikings tight end, Kyle Rudolph. Former tennis star, James Blake. And a winner on the World Long Drive Championship Circuit, Troy Mullins. Appreciate all of you being with me today. And it's safe to say that we would not be sitting here having this conversation if not for the events of May 25th, the death of an unarmed black man named George Floyd in Minneapolis at the hands of police. It was captured on television or on a, on a video camera that was later put on television in broad daylight. Uh, it shocked the nation and many watching at home. Coach, I want to begin with you to go back to that day in particular. Sure. What do you remember? What were your emotions? You know, my, my emotions were how can how can someone who's sworn to protect and service just so easily put his knee on someone's neck and and murder them and with no ram and and to think there's going to be no ramifications for that you know that that just uh, it, it was unbelievable just watching that. How about for you, James? I mean, this was had to hit home for you as someone who five years ago was tackled on a on a. Manhattan Street, yeah. handcuffed. So, well, first of all, I think we wouldn't be talking about this if that didn't happen, but I also think we clearly wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't on video. That's what's changed so much in the past few years about this, is this has been going on and has been yelled and screamed about by the black community for, for a long time, and the video has now made it possible for people uh, to realize that this is actually happening, and it's still happening in broad daylight. It happened to me. I was, you know, tackled. Uh, in broad daylight for no reason. And if there wasn't a video, I don't think the world would have believed me over the police officer's word. And I think that's what's been happening for so long. And, and I agree, it's, it's shocking, it's awful, but people are now ready to listen, ready to learn. And like Coach Lynn said, um, the officers don't believe there's accountability because for so long there hasn't been enough accountability. And since that time, I've been on such a roller coaster of emotions because that day you feel sadness due to the tragedy that, that uh, befell, befell that family. But then I was so encouraged to see that America cared. There was that protest. There was so many people that, that got up and did something about it. Unfortunately, that was hijacked at times by looters and rioters. That, but the message endured. And I think that is what is still going on, is that the message is we're still looking for equality. And it's not here yet. It's 2020. Should have happened many, many years ago. And it's not going to happen overnight. But they're still fighting for the right, the right cause and for justice. What have the last week's been like for you, Troy? I mean, after seeing that video, and it, and, it, and it didn't just start there. I think earlier in the day, there was a video with the false report on the bird watcher and watching how real that is, that, you know, I've experienced and some people have experienced, you know, being racially profiled and seeing that and how real she was really threatened by a man that was doing nothing. And then to see the George Floyd later in the day I was, I was in tears for at least two days, and it really hit me because it's just this. This isn't the first time, and it's been years and years. And I saw your video, and that affected me deeply, as an athlete, as a, an incredible athlete, to be treated this way, to have video evidence, and now we have a man doing nothing, losing his life, and we watched it. Like it was just, it was really hard to see how uncaring we've become that that somebody could just do that to another life and what that means in our society now that we've we're unfeeling we're so into our phones and into ourselves that we have no more humanity that we've lost it somewhere and what it means to be an american what it means to be a black american a black woman um, playing a very you know majority white sport i felt that i wasn't doing enough that that i needed to change my life somehow to be able to be a bigger voice for people that don't have a voice 
this happened in the city where you play football, Kyle. You're trying to navigate this moment as a white American male. What has that been like for you? Well, it's, it's not just the city that I play football in. It's the city that I call home. It's the city that all three of my kids were born in and the city that all three of my kids will be raised in. And uh, I remember as a child in Cincinnati in 2001, uh, we dealt with a very similar situation. Um, and never would I had imagined that almost 20 years later, I'd be right in the middle of the same situation. And I remember sitting at my house and, and telling my wife that if, if we don't do something about this now, how, how can we allow something like this to be around 20 years from now when our kids are adults? And you know, what a shame it would be if, if this doesn't stop right now. And you know, for us, it is, it's home and it was right in our backyard. And it was disappointing to me because this isn't something that you know, now on the social justice front, our organization and our players are now called to action. You know, we've been working at this for the last three years and we've had a committee in our organization led by our owners who are children of Holocaust survivors, uh, you know, know the ultimate oppression. Um, and and we, we didn't do enough to make a quick enough change. Um, but I do think there are a lot of things in motion on the ground there. And, and we're making small steps as a team. And, you know, I feel a responsibility, you know, you said it, as a white male to, to be there to support, be there to listen. Um, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of times in interviews that, you know, until you're a product of your environment and until you step out of your environment and put yourself in someone else's shoes. For me, that was sitting in those social justice meetings and listening to my teammates and to their stories and things that they've gone through, because I've never gone through that as a white male. But it allows me to have empathy instead of sympathy. And I think that's what's important for us as white Americans to help change things. I, I think that's so encouraging to hear, and I think that's what's happening now. And, and that's why when you talk about your kids being raised and them not having to see this in 20 years, that's what got me so encouraged about the protests is that this isn't, hopefully this isn't gonna become just one more statistic, one more number. And I really believe the young people and I don't include myself in that anymore. I'm past that point, but the young people are really mobilizing. They're wanting to listen. They're wanting to learn and step out of themselves to become something better and make it make it even better. And that's why I was so encouraged. I was so sad in the day of the events. And our kids will grow up in a, in a place that will be hopefully more just for all. Yeah. I'd have to piggyback off of that. I went. I did participate in one protest in Huntington Beach, and I was surprised how many young people were out there. And I was a minority. And they were passionate about speaking up for Black Lives Matter and, and, and the protests and all. And, and, and it's like they were sick of it. It's like the generation behind us, the, the millennials, the Gen Zs, they are not going to tolerate this. And, and that was really encouraging to see and made me feel good to be out marching with them. A lot of people are feeling a sense of deja vu with these conversations. My father had them with me. His father had them with, with, that, with him. How are you navigating this in your own home? I know you've had conversations with your own son Absolutely. about dealing with police. You know, it was unfortunate. I had the conversation with my grandfather about how to deal with police, not to not get arrested if I wanted to stay alive. And it was very uncomfortable when I had to have that conversation with my son when he turned 16. But I, I desperately feel like we need to have that talk. And after watching what happened to George Floyd, we went back and revisited that conversation again. He's 30 years old now. And so uh, it's, it's just unfortunate. It's a conversation that you have to have with your young people growing up and how to handle the police. And uh, that culture has got to change. You know, uh, I know so many good police officers, first of all. A lot of good police officers. My son's godfather is a police officer. Two police officers practically saved my life when I got hit by a car. So uh, I, I have nothing but respect for the law and police officers. But there is a culture there. And, and that culture uh, with young black men is not good. And it is taught from, from time that we're, we're kids all the way up. And uh, that's got to change. And, and that whole mentality of when you take the streets, shoot first and ask questions later, I don't understand that. When, you, when you're sworn to protect and serve, I don't understand that. You know, and so it's just so much anxiety between the African-American community and police officers. And, and, and it's, it's always been there. But it's got to change now. Is it different this time? It seems like it's more multicultural. I'm hearing more optimism than pessimism. But there's also, in my own worry, that 
something could happen and we turn the page and we're on to the next thing. Uh, what, what is your level of optimism versus pessimism, Troy? I mean, like you said, I think the next generation is is really impassioned and it's amazing to see how how our cultures have mixed, like with millennials and Gen Z that they don't see it as different, you know, races. They're all one. They love like our music. They love our art. They love our like hair, our bodies. Like they've really embraced African American culture. And I went to one of the protests in LA and it was amazing to see the colors of people there and we're all in masks and we're all social distancing, but it was packed and we're sitting there and we're kneeling and saying the names of people that have passed and it was so powerful. And I brought my 16 year old brother with me and I wanted him to experience that and to understand what's happening and be a part of the change because he's the next generation to do it. And, and it's unfortunate that, you know, we're talking about defunding the police and that was a big movement for Black Lives Matter and people aren't understanding again what that really means. They're like, oh, I can't believe you want to be a part of getting rid of the police. But it's not that. We want to enrich our communities and give money back to schools because that's where it starts. It starts with education. It starts with educating people about the history of our country and not negating the negative part of, of how the country came to be and where these ideas of race and and racism came from. And um, I think that, you know, when we have more of these conversations, maybe people will listen to the fact that racism, racism exists, that it's real, and uh, that America is not as, you know, perfect as they think it is, and that's okay. And there's no shame in not knowing. There's no shame in um, being an American and being naive that it's okay to learn and to still grow, I think. And so, yeah. How about that idea of, of defunding the police? That's been a topic. Some people hear that and they say, well, you're going to shut down the police department. <laughs> Others are saying, no, divert some of the funds yeah. toward education or community outreach. Your yeah, thoughts? I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm not a marketing expert, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a bad marketing uh, <laughs> strategy. The, the, the defund the police uh, sounds too drastic. Sounds yeah. I think people that yeah. don't, dig into the details of it, they just immediately get scared that yeah. someone's going to break into their house and they're not going to be able to call anyone. They're going to be in danger. And that's not the way it's going to be. It's going to still decrease crime. If you increase education, you create more of an equal uh, system where there isn't the same kind of level of poverty. Because you're much more likely to commit a crime if you're poor. If you're, uh, if you're in destitute situa in, a, in a situation like that, then you are uh, if you're not. If you've got a home, if you've got a place to go. And so they're, they, if you've got a community center where they're promoting, they're promoting uh, much more, more better, better morals and values, and that's what they're going to divert some of the funds to. And they're going to make, hopefully, the, the goal is to make the police officer's jobs easier. Um, and so you would think they wouldn't have this shoot first attitude and they would be able to uh, interact with the communities and build back the trust. The, the trust is gone. Coach Lynn talked about that. The trust is gone. We have to have those conversations with our kids. I had that conversation with my dad. The first thing I said when I got tackled was, I'm complying 100%. And that shouldn't have to be your response the first time you, you interact with a police officer. And that's because that's the way my dad taught me. It's, it's stay alive. Do whatever you can to stay alive. Sort it out later with lawyers or however you want to do it, but just stay alive in that, in that moment. And the fact that you have to have those kind of rules in 2020 means that, yeah, maybe we, need, we do need to do something drastic to change the whole way that the police interact with African-American community and the way that the community interacts with the police. So I, I definitely think there's a maybe a better way to say it. I'm not going to come up with a solution right now, but probably a better way to say it than defund the police. Any ideas, Kyle? I think so. I, I mentioned the social justice committee that we have on the Vikings and um, actually both of these topics, the kids and education and defunding the police were things that came up. And, you know, again, I can't say enough good things about our owners. And, you know, they just donated another $5 million to whatever we decide as a committee to outsource that to. And, to those two topics, it were, you know, and a couple of my teammates brought up some really staggering statistics that, again, myself as a white male growing up, um, you know, I went to private Catholic schools. I didn't have a police officer in my school 
I had guidance counselors, I, we had psychologists. Um, the statistics on inner city and underprivileged schools that have a police officer and no counselor or a police officer and no psychologist is staggering. It's almost like half or two thirds. And I don't know the statistics exactly, but I remember it was Anthony Barr specifically mentioned these points. And I just couldn't believe it because we're talking about you're already fostering a bad relationship at a young age. Kid gets in trouble, you go see the police officer and he disciplines you. You know, what kind of culture are we creating when that's the case? Like, if the kid's getting in trouble, he clearly has issues. Like, why, should, why wouldn't he not be seeing a counselor or a psychologist? Who knows what's going on at home? Instead, you send him to a police officer. Now there's already a negative connotation between that young kid and law enforcement. And then to the defunding the police, um, you know, I, Coach Lynn mentioned it earlier. It's not fair to, to categorize all law enforcement as, as bad people. Um, I have law enforcement in my family and they're some of the people that I respect the most in this world. They have a really hard job. And it's almost like, again, I go to psychologists, you know, as high level athletes, we have sports psychologists. Our military has psychologists. Our police officers have nobody to talk to. And if, if we're taking more funds away from them, that's less resources. We need to get more resources for both. The kids need more resources because our country is going to change with youth. But I also do believe that if we can provide more resources for police officers, we can change behavior. So I think that's a good point in the defunding the police. I think getting the resources there, it's just the way they use it. Instead of right. if you give them more resources, that doesn't go to another grenade launcher and not more SWAT gear, riot gear. You need them to have a psychologist with them, you know, when they're in their SWAT car. Yep. You need to have more uh, resources going to actually helping the education of the officers, helping them do what they do, but not just more tactical gear. I think that's where I think yeah. the, sure. the messaging gets sure. lost with the defund the police. The SWAT cars, right. things that are irrelevant. Think, yeah, exactly. Right. So I think they need, they, they absolutely need the help and the resources. And that's why it's never going to be completely defunding the police, getting rid of anything they, they have and leaving them on a bare bones budget. It's using those resources to actually help them and, and make them better and more efficient instead of just throwing more weapons at them. Agreed. One of the other things I've learned too, because again, I, you asked about your initial reactions and you know, I, I'm sitting there in my house in Minneapolis and I just, this officer, it wasn't the first time something like this happened. I mean, his track record, how he could have been on our streets patrolling is, beyond me and it's that's, absolutely ridiculous that's the accountability part yeah and if so if you're an attorney if you're a head coach you don't have a job yeah if, if you have that track record if i mess up that many times you're not putting me on the field, <laughs> don't put you on the field. yeah right. and that's and, a huge issue with almost every officer yeah. i did i mean i remember doing some research when it happened to me almost every officer that kills an innocent uh, an unarmed uh, victim they almost always have a track record. I mean, 99% of the time, they have a track record of misconduct or excessive force. And so the officer that, that tackled me had five. Wow. It was his fifth. He lost five vacation days for tackling me. So to me, that's a slap on the wrist. Get right back out there and do the same thing. And at that point, who's at fault? I mean, he's being told you can do this and keep going. And then this officer, I believe the officer that killed George Floyd had 17 or 18, yes. something like that, where at some point the accountability has to, has to kick in. And that's one of the reforms that is talked about the police reform is having the national database of misconduct. Because you can have misconduct at one, uh, one station, lose your job, go to another, they have no record of it, you go and do the same thing. That's, I mean, if you, if you mess up on the Vikings, they know in, in L.A., they know somewhere else, they we have the, this. We get the same video. Exactly. Yeah. They have all the same information, <laughs> and that's where they need to be held accountable. And you can't have someone, because they, they do have a very difficult job, and they're handling lethal force. It needs to be taken seriously that if they can't do the job effectively and with the right temperament, they shouldn't be out there. They need to find a different line of work. And through these meetings well, with our social justice committee, we were able to meet with the Minneapolis police chief, Police Rondo, in you know, one of the questions that I brought up was just that. How, how do these officers continue to just get a slap on the wrist and then they're back out there on our streets serving and protecting? And he brought up police unions. Yep. And he could get rid of a guy. He brought up an example. And I could fire a guy on Monday. And, you know, Wednesday he's back in work because the union's protecting him. And, again, talking to my family members that are police officers, they mentioned the same thing. They're like, the police unions are the ones protecting these bad cops. Yeah. And 
you know, our police chief in Minneapolis, he's like, you know, at times I'm battling union, battling union, battling union, and my hands are tied and they show back up at work. And I think that's a battle that we can use our platform to help him because yeah. people in the real world have no idea. They don't understand that the police chief's trying to do the right thing. He's trying to get rid of this guy who's had 12, 17 misconducts. And yet here's a union that's backing him up and getting him back on the squad. These unions have so much power, and that's one of the big issues that it will not change overnight, but needs to be drastically overhauled because they have political power. They're allowed to donate to the district attorney. So whoever they get elected, they may have donated $2 million to that district attorney. They're the ones that are deciding who gets charged and who doesn't. And they have that kind of power, and that's how they can get a police officer right back on because they're not going to be held accountable criminally because they're, you know, they're the ones that have this power. And they fight so hard, and they've been policing each other for so long that the precedent is set. I asked for the officer that did this to me to be fired. They said, well, we can't do that. It'll look like special treatment for you because in the past, all we've done is five vacation days. So, well, isn't this a case to change that precedent? Nope, they can't change it because they, they've always been policing themselves. And these are the sort of the rules and laws that they've set, and they, that's something that is going to take a long time but needs to change, I think, as well. You guys have put out a lot of great ideas. I'm hearing a lot of optimism about the future. You guys use the word change quite a bit. If we sit here one year from now, what do you want society to be looking like? I mean, to be honest, I love for it to look like a football team. You know, I, I've, we've had these conversations with coaches and players and, and, and even guys from other teams about how do we accomplish this? I mean, we, you get a group of guys sometimes that grow up and they're taught to hate each other, but they come together under certain circumstances and they grind every day and they get to know one another and they trust one another. And they become like brothers. And I can't think of a better example. The guys coming from different backgrounds, economic wise, different races. And, and different beliefs and religions. But when it's all said and done, so many times, I've seen racism change on a football team. You know, my best friend that I've been with since third grade, you know, uh, this white country boy, Rocky Jones, Palo Point, Texas, you know? It, it just, I, the example that I guess him and I was setting for the rest of our teammates, I didn't, we, we didn't realize it at the time, but we, we couldn't have been two opposite guys, but it was sports. And it was teamwork that brought us together. And uh, those intangibles, those dynamics, there's something really special about that. And, uh, and I often wish that America could be like a, like a sports team. It's not a burden for you to, to, to deal with this, to answer these questions. I feel like a lot of people expect the, the black community to figure this out. How does that jive with you? Well, I think that's, um, that's often the, the sentiment, is that this is a black issue. This is a black community needs to solve it. But Right now, I'm extremely optimistic about the fact that we're it's seemingly having more allies now in the majority. The white community is, um, is ready to listen, ready to learn, ready to educate themselves, and um, have compassion, which is extremely, extremely encouraging to me. Um, I mean, Jackie Robinson had Branch Rickey. Uh, Althea Gibson never would have won Wimbledon if it wasn't for Alice Marble standing up for her, getting her on the tour and getting her able to be played. So you're going to have that. And, and that's why these feel different. This, these protests feel different. Like Coach Lynn said, like Troy said, you're seeing very diverse groups that are protesting, that are wanting change. I think it's because so many young people now have more information. Um, the, the generation I grew up in, generation um, I feel like we all grew up in, not including you, you're definitely younger, you're younger too, but definitely the generation I grew up in, it's you're, what your parents say is the way it goes. I feel like a lot of people in my generation and older, they just went by what their parents said. Nowadays, I see young kids, I talk to a lot of high school kids that, hey, my dad said this, but I don't know if I agree with it, and I'm going to go research this and find out. And you know what? Hey, they're educating the parents sometimes. I've talked to a lot of high school kids that said their parents had it backwards, and they had to talk to them, and they had to show them statistics, and they had to let them know. So to me, it's encouraging that a lot of white people, a lot of young white people right now are realizing that this is a moment that they can make better for their kids, for their kids' kids, and a year from now be better. But even more important, 5, 10, 15 years from now, we don't have to have these same kind of conversations with as much urgency as, we have, as we're having them right now. These are not easy topics. I want to thank all of you for your time and your honesty. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, we'll hear from Steph Curry, Charles Barkley, Ozzie Smith, and Jimmy Rollins. We'll be right back.